Good evening, everybody. It's, it's dark up here, but I know you're out there. Uh, welcome to the third installment of this year's Madison Vision Series. I am Jonathan Alger, president of James Madison University, and it's a delight to have all of you here. The Madison Vision Series provides an opportunity for our community to explore major public issues of our time. We hope to stimulate thought, discussion, and action with a variety of speakers, perspectives, and disciplines. As a university, our mission requires us to look toward the future at all times, to anticipate the constantly evolving needs of the society and the world of work, and to prepare graduates to be lifelong learners who can adapt to the changes all around them. We take that responsibility seriously here at JMU and have been recognized for our innovation and the ways in which we prepare graduates with the intellectual and interpersonal skills they need to thrive in the 21st century. These efforts are reflected by our recent number one ranking for post-graduation employment outcomes among Virginia universities. And yes, we can clap for that. So today's panelists are great representatives of that commitment. Each speaker will introduce themselves and tell you a bit about their story, but I wanted to recognize each of them. So in alphabetical order, Jennifer Morgan, would you raise your hand as I... Oh, sorry. So uh, Jennifer Morgan is a 1993 graduate and is the co-chief executive officer of SAP. She's the first female CEO in SAP history and the first woman to serve as a CEO for a company on the German DAX index. Carrie Owen Pleats is a 1997 graduate and the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the Hospital Division of Wellstar Health System. Carrie oversees strategy and operations for all of Wellstar's 11 hospitals. And Kathy Warden is a 1992 graduate and the Chairman, CEO, and President of Northrop Grumman which designs, develops, builds, and supports some of the world's most advanced products. Among many other responsibilities, Kathy also currently serves on JMU's Board of Visitors, and thank you, Kathy, for that service. All three of these alums have graciously given back to JMU and connected with our students. Indeed, the recruiting event that you may have noticed in the atrium was their idea. So students, the tables will be set up again after the event, so please stop by if you are looking for employment or internship opportunities. And let's hope there's some, some good conversation happening tonight there. And now, it's my special honor to introduce tonight's moderator, who adds even more star quality to this August panel. Bobby Kilberg is president and CEO of the Northern Virginia Technology Council, one of the largest technology councils in the nation. She's held this position since 1998, and sadly, but well-deserved, she is retiring this year after a job well done. And congratulations on that, Bobby. Now, Bobby is a graduate of Yale Law School, Columbia University, and Vassar College. She has served in various positions in the administrations, and get this, of Presidents Nixon, Ford, and George H.W. Bush. And in 2001, she was appointed by President George W. Bush to serve as a member of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. She's also served as an attorney at a major law firm, Vice President for Ac Academic Affairs at Mount Vernon College, and Director of the Aspen Institute's Project on the Future of Private Philanthropy. Now I have to say, Bobby, as a personal aside, I'd note that Bobby is living proof that lawyers can have many talents, right? <laughs> I cannot think, I cannot think of a better leader to direct tonight's conversation on the future of work. After the panelists have had an initial discussion with Bobby, we will open the floor to questions from the audience. And let me especially encourage students to ask questions and get advice from these amazing panelists. So please join me in welcoming our guests to the stage and to James Madison University. Good evening. 
I'd actually like to start, Jonathan, by pointing out that Jonathan Alger is a member of NVTC's board of directors, and he's taken our board to an entirely new level. Thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> so what we have here today is Jen Morgan, co-CEO of SAP and a former NVTC board member, Carrie Pleitz, executive vice president and C COO of the hospital division of Wellstar Health Systems, and Kathy Warden, chairman and CEO of Northrop Grumman. It is really exceptional, I think, that all three of these women are graduates of JMU. Just think about that. What a credit and testament that this is to a wonderful, wonderful institution. And just to brag a little bit about the Virginia region, please note that there are, of the five largest defense contractors in the entire world, three of them are headed by women. Kathy Northrop Grumman, uh, Marilyn Houston Lockheed Martin, and Phoebe Novakovich of General Dynamics, and others are far, not far behind them. And if you were an American defense contractor, you would be on the list as well. <laughs> Finally, um, this afternoon I had the privilege of, um, of being a guest teacher or lecturer at an eth a senior ethics class in the business school. And let me tell you folks, they were some of the most impressive young people I have ever seen. Their questions were pointed, polite, they are committed to their communities, and with students like that graduating from um, JMU and going into the, the workplace and the work market, you have a very, very bright future ahead. So thank you to all those students in the ethics class. <laughs> now, as the President Alger said, I'm going to invite each of you to introduce yourselves for about five minutes and describe your leadership journey. Basically, how did you get to where you are today? Why are you here? And after that, I will address one question to each of you, and I'm sure you will all interrupt and, and uh, comment and make that very interactive. And then I think we're going to go right to the audience to ask you to participate very early in this process so that you get a chance to talk about the issues that are most important to you. So. Let me start with Jen. Okay. Well, I guess it all started here at JMU. Um, and I remember the recruiting fair was over at Shorts, which is no longer here. Scared. Right. <laughs> um, and I was recruited by um, Anderson Consulting, which is now Accenture. And, and I really remember just being so excited about that first offer and, and that they came down here on campus. And that was a really great first about seven years. And, and I love that because. I had the opportunity to really to work at different client sites to consult and to get an experience of different companies and what different industries were about and just kind of learn what it was like to work in a professional environment. And from there I went to um, a software company called Siebel, which was a CRM, customer relationship management company, very hot at the time, around the time of dot com in 2000. Um, and then from there I went to SAP after several years and I've been here been here for about 15 years or so. And coming into SAP and having been in the, no the Northern Virginia area, I spent a lot of time both on the commercial side of business, um, meaning working with commercial companies in different industries, but also in public sector, because Northern Virginia, there was quite a bit of business up there, as, as you all well know. And I loved it, because I thought it was such a great area to both get experience in government and what it was like to work with government and use technology to solve problems in government, as well as get an, an opportunity to work in a global company and get a chance to almost have a classroom of learning through all the clients that we were able to support. And, uh, and just kind of worked my way up. I don't know that I ever had a master plan, Bobby, to get to where I am, but I'll tell one quick story, because you know we all have forks in the road that we look back on and say, wow, if I hadn't done this, or if, if I hadn't done this by mistake, I wouldn't be where I was right now. And at the time, my husband and I, we met at Anderson Consulting. And um, we had had our first child, and it was about um, in 2001. And at that time, that's when the dot-com bust hit. A lot of companies were kind of pulling back on, um, on their third-party spending. And at the time, we, we had just had a child and weren't sure what we were going to do about childcare. I always assumed I would stay home. I had a mother who stayed home with me. I thought I would stay home with our child, and maybe at some point I'd go back to work. Well, lo and behold, my husband had an opportunity to take a sabbatical, and it was a temporary thing to us. And so we said, you know what? 
it'll give us some time to figure out what we want to do. So let's do that. We can figure out the daycare, and then we'll go from there. Now, that was almost 19 years ago. And I tell the story because many times in life when we're faced with decisions, we tend to evaluate them in a, in a very permanent way. If I do this, then this is what will happen next. And when that happens, this will happen next. And when we do that, we wear kind of you know, blinders and we lose sight of all the beautiful forks in the road that can take you to new places. And so I always say you have to sometimes make decisions not thinking that every decision is permanent and see where it leads you. And that's where I got to where I am. Carrie? Absolutely. And I think we might have a trend here where the, um, uh, the feature of leadership started right here. So um, I um, uh, came in to JMU as a dance major. Dance. Any other dance majors <laughs> in the audience? Yes. Um, so, um, but um, I had already gone up to New York and, and done a few things and recognized that if um, my body wasn't going to last forever and there's not um, a lot of uh, money in dance, not completely. Um, but I always knew that my passion was in healthcare. Both of my parents were um, MTs in the Air Force. Um, and they both went into careers in the healthcare field. And so I knew there was something about healthcare, but it wasn't until my second semester, freshman year, and I, did, um, I took a health services administration class by an amazing professor. And it was one of those classes where um, the students stay after to have fun debate with each other and uh, ask dialogue. I mean, we were just so engrossed in it. And I have been engrossed in it ever since. So I decided um, freshman year undergraduate, I was changing my major away from dance, which my parents were super thrilled about. Um, <laughs> so I went into health services administration, but I didn't really know exactly what that meant and where I wanted to be. Um, but I started to then take um, uh, work during the summer. And my first, um, my first job in healthcare was as a patient advocate. And uh, so there are a lot of different roles um, in healthcare, but I loved being that individual who came in and sat down and held the hand um, of, of the patients that were struggling with their disease. No, I wasn't providing clinical care, but I was healing in my own way. Um, and so I, I stuck with healthcare administration. I went on to get my master's at um, just down the street at the Medical College of Virginia, or Virginia Commonwealth University, as it's called today, um, and uh, did my master's there. And then decided during the last year they do have a required residency. And I decided to go to California. Uh, so I did my residency in California and worked for an amazing not for profit healthcare system called Sutter Health in Northern California. Uh, and I thought I was only going to be there for a year, um, and I was there for 17. Uh, so, but I had this wonderful opportunity to be sponsored by amazing leaders in the organization who saw something in me, and in some cases probably saw more than I thought um, I had uh, in myself. But I worked really hard uh, and uh, progressed through the job, so I became chief operating officer of a different hospital. We had four hospitals in San Francisco, which is such a fun fun place. And I'm reminded by that number, I forgot there are so many hills in Harrisonburg. <laughs> I was reminded today um, about that. So uh, stayed with Sutter Health, uh, ended up being a CEO of uh, uh, a couple of different hospitals in the Sacramento area. And then I got called by a, um, a headhunter uh, to go back to Atlanta, Georgia, which is where I was born, and come back to the East Coast and um, take on this wonderful, amazing opportunity to join a fantastic healthcare system that, um, and I'm a not-for-profit girl. Um, I'm focused on um, that thing that drew me in the first place, which is that patient advocacy. And everything. I, I'm so um, thankful every single day for this wonderful privilege and gift um, to take care of the people who are take caring, uh, taking care of the patients that we serve and have the privilege to serve every day within our communities. And um, I, didn't, I didn't recognize it, talking about stories, I, I didn't recognize where my true passion for patient advocacy really came from, but I reflected on this and I shared the story earlier today, which was the first time I'd actually truly shared the story, um, because every time I share the story I get totally choked up. So now it's my second time telling the story, so you're just going to have to bear with me for a second. But when I was about 10 years old, I found a photo album, in which half the audience doesn't know what a photo album is anymore. Um, um, but I found a photo album, and it was of this, um, it was this little girl, and I thought it was me, but it, um, she had blue eyes. And I'm like, did my eyes change colors? I'm like, oh. 
Um, and I'm, so I'm having this conversation with my mom saying, I, I think this is me, but I don't have blue eyes. She said, it's not you, it's your, it's your sister, Cheryl. And um, I, don't, I had a sister who died before I was born um, from leukemia. Um, that's why I've only told it twice. <laughs> um, and so it, it sparked something in me to recognize that there are people who do amazing work this wonderful gift of healing and saving lives. Um, and I didn't necessarily want it to be that, but there's this, I wanted to be the one holding my mom's hand through the process because it, it, Cheryl didn't survive. Um, but there are people who helped my mother through the grieving process and through this healing process that's so incredibly powerful. And so I think that sparked something in me very early on to continue to be a patient advocate, um, and I always will be. I'm so blessed for something that sparked so long ago by a photo album, but it wasn't until I got to JMU where it truly became um, the career. Uh, it allowed me to um, nurture that passion um, in me, and I'm so forever grateful um, for the experience that I had here and for the foundation that was laid. So thank you, JMU. Yes, Carrie, thank you for sharing that personal story. I think it's so important that we can share things that are vulnerable in our lives because in so many ways that's what shapes us into who we are. I too had crossroads that happened along the same timelines that you heard from both Jen and Carrie. My first one started here at JMU. I came to JMU as a pre-law major and I had interned in a law firm and Bobby and John, please don't hold it against me, but I decided that that wasn't the career path that I wanted to follow. And so I too switched my major in freshman year and chose to study computer information systems. I left here and went to work for General Electric, which was a great company, I learned so much there. But I left there after about seven years to join a startup because I had a real passion for wanting to go out on my own and me and three other partners started this organization and it did well. But 2001 came along, and Jen talked about that being a pivotal time in her life. For me, our startup was based in Washington, D.C., but we had offices in New York City as well. And unfortunately, 9-11 hit our client base very hard. That year in 2001, many of our clients had to really stop focusing on their day-to-day operations to take care of their people, rebuild their offices, and restart their infrastructure. So that was a really pivotal time in our business. And our company had other customers who were in the federal government. And at the time, it was a big shift for us to start working with the federal government and helping to address the information sharing issues that in many ways contributed to us not understanding that we had terrorists operating in this country. That activity in 2001 is what started me on the path in aerospace and defense. And it also taught me a really important lesson about myself and that is that I draw passion from having a purpose and doing work that really matters. And I think that's very much what you heard in Carrie's story as well, that it's not just about getting up and going to work every day and doing a job, but it's about doing work that you feel like is making the world a better place. And so I got started on that path in 2001, and my journey was uh, one that took me to two different companies, General Dynamics and then Northrop Grumman. I joined Northrop Grumman in 2008 and took on roles of increasing responsibility, never really with an eye toward becoming the CEO of the company, just trying to expand the impact that I could have and had the opportunity to become CEO at the beginning of 2019 and chairman later that year. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, now to my three seminal questions, uh, and I will alter the order. Kathy, uh, you are a member of the Business Roundtable, and as many know, the Business Roundtable was formed in 1972 uh, and consists of the CEOs of the largest U.S. major corporations. And its purpose is to promote public policy favorable to business. It has well over 200 members. In August of 2019, it did something really quite extraordinary. 
it issued a statement on the purpose of a corporation and it redefined the purpose of a corporation so that it put the interests of employees, customers, suppliers, and communities on par with what had been the sole purpose before, or the sole defined purpose before, which was shareholders. And that was put all those on a par with shareholders. What is the role, how is the role of the corporation changing, and with it the role of leadership, including diversity? So the realization that I and the 183 CEOs that signed on to the new purpose statement had is that you can't create long-term shareholder value with also, without also thinking about all the other stakeholders that Bobby articulated. Clearly, employees create the value of a corporation. Customers are the, the purchaser of the goods and services that we offer and are critical elements to our success. But we also live and work in those communities that need us to be responsible citizens, whether from an environmental and sustainability perspective or to do good and help in education and other areas of interest to the community. And then our suppliers are an important part of how we deliver goods and services on a daily basis. And it's not just about our success, but it's about all of those who work together with us to create that success. And so that was the real impetus behind the statement and broadening the definition of a corporation's purpose. And I can tell you that all of the CEOs who signed it wanted it not to just be a symbol of how we feel, but also a platform to communicate what we're doing, to back up that statement. And it has created a great conversation across businesses, a sharing of best practices, and a real emphasis on sustainability that is taking hold across this country and I think will serve all citizens uh, quite well. You ask about diversity. It's a really important topic also among all corporations because we want to tap into the potential of the workforce that exists and our workforce is so much more diverse today. It's not just about having diversity, and that's measured in representation, both for gender and ethical and racial diversity, but it's also about looking at the inclusion of the talent that you have and what are the opportunities for people to have a voice so that we have the value of that diversity influencing new ideas and better decision making. And there is a lot of research that shows that companies that have more diverse leadership teams perform better. I am sure, Jen and Carrie, that you see that as well. In our own corporation, when I joined the company 11 years ago, we did not have a very diverse leadership team. Our stock price sat at $66 a share when I joined the company. Today, it's at about $360 a share, and our leadership team is far more diverse. That is not a coincidence. It is a direct correlation because that diversity of ideas has helped us to perform better. Uh, to all three of you on that first question, could the Business Roundtable have issued this statement in the 70s, the 80s, or the 90s? Why, or was just this the right time to do it? Should it have done it before? I think many companies were already working with that broader purpose in mind, and so this wasn't so much a shift in 2019 of how companies were operating, but I will tell you that shift has happened over the last decade. So I don't think this would have or could have happened in the 80s or the 90s, but certainly over the last decade, there has been a real awakening by corporations of this broader responsibility. Do either of you want to add to that? You know, I think I would just add, and I'm, I, I didn't know that that existed, and um, just as a consumer, of, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just thrilled to hear it. So uh, thank you for bringing it up, Bobby. Um, I, it's, it's, we, um, healthcare is just inherently diverse, and we treat a diverse, so many diverse communities that in order to truly provide great, amazing care, you have to know and understand who you're serving, and the best way to do that is to be a reflective, uh, have the leadership and the team reflective of the communities that you're serving. Um, I'm happy with, with, with Wellstar has been recognized by Fortune 100 um, Best Places to Work 
for diversity and inclusion, um, and also just was recognized for Fortune 100 best places to work for, for healthcare and biopharma. Um, but that doesn't happen without being very diligent and thoughtful about not just ensuring that you've got a diverse workforce um, that covers every type of definition of diversity, but it's also the level of inclusivity. About how do you ensure that the voices are heard and acted upon and in part of the fabric um, for every meeting, for every decision. And that doesn't take place without um, very strong intention. Um, as at the board level too, which is in Atlanta, Georgia, um, coming from California, it's, it's, it's been an interesting dynamic, uh, slightly, slightly um, more challenging, um, but um, I'm very proud of the work that the board and the leadership ha team has done over the past, I would say, 10 years as well, and probably more so in the past five. So that was great. Jen, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, you hear the word empathy used a lot more in business today. You know, when we were coming up the chain, you, you got a job and you were loyal to the corporation and you hope that you could keep that job because if you weren't in a company for a certain amount of time, somebody thought, well, what was wrong with you? And, and now leaders today, CEOs today, have to have an incredible, um, leaders in general have to have an incredible amount of empathy you know, to keep people, whether it be your employees, whether it be your shareholders. Um, you know, activism is not just, not just something that shareholders bring, right? Employees are activists. Your customers are activists. Your suppliers, the community. And so that level of empathy and awareness um, that a leader has to have today is like it's never been before. Uh, Jen's question. Uh, Jen, you just got back from the De Davos Economic Forum, I think two weeks ago, and interestingly enough, my 32-year-old son was there as well and heard you speak. And you talked about a need to disrupt ready. Yes. Disrupt ready. Yes. What do you mean by that? And how is technology changing the employee experience at work and the way we interact, I, your executive team interacts with colleagues and friends? Yeah, so I talked about disrupting ready, and what do I mean by that? So when we, when we graduated from college, and as we interviewed for various jobs, then you, know, you look at the, the job description, and the job description explains a job and then says what's needed, what skills or you know, experience is needed for a job. And we tended to take that quite literally. Five years of experience here, this degree, that degree. And women in particular take that extremely literally. Um, and many times to their own disadvantage, say, well, I don't have exactly what it has, so I'm not even going to apply. And you know, a man might have half the skills and think he's the most qualified person in the world, which, by the way, is how, and that's a good thing, by the way. And women need to think the same way. But I digress. Um, <laughs> But disrupting ready means that when you look at today, like we talked, we're talking a lot about leaders, right? When we were growing up, CEOs in the profile of a CEO was pretty much 80% consistent of, this, of the, the kind of skills, experiences, temperament, you know, what that profile looked like. And then maybe 20% different depending on who was in, in the leadership role. Today, if you look at leaders in government, you look at leaders of corporations, of incredible startups, you have people leading who are who are young, who don't maybe necessarily have the traditional experience, but they have an intellect and an idea and surround themselves with really interesting people to be able to do something really different. So what does that mean? It means that being ready for whatever your next role is isn't really defined by the traditional set of um, you know, textbook characteristics. And, and too many times I think we hold ourselves back when we think about what it means to be ready or what somebody else's definition of ready is. So when I talk about disrupting ready, it's about thinking a little bit differently. And, and the biggest eye opener for me was many times leaders uh, will do skip level discussions. So that means they'll, they'll meet with not just the people who report to them, but the next level down, the next level of talent, right? Because that's the next people that you're cultivating. And I was so excited because I got to go have a skip level discussion at the time with the president of our North America division. So I, you know, he called me up there, I went in, we had a great discussion about what was next and what I wanted to do. And you know, obviously he was a big supporter of mine. Um, and he said to me, so Jen, when, will you, when do you think you're ready for the next, the next the, you know, to go ahead and do all the stuff that we're talking about? And I said, 
I probably need another year. Now, I didn't think anything of it at the time. I had a great meeting, I left, until I went to another event much like this, and I heard somebody, like one of these two amazing women speaking, and basically they told a similar story and said, you're holding yourself back. And I thought back to that moment and thought, not only was I holding myself back and not believing I was ready, I was explaining to somebody else that I wasn't ready. <laughs> and that was a big eye-opener for me. So we have to disrupt this notion of what we think ready is and go for it. Yes. And in another time and place, you'll tell me all about millennials, right? Yeah. <laughs> OK, Carrie, yes. what are the hot jobs of the future, and how do we prepare for them? How must our education change to provide the skill sets for the 21st century economy? And how do we ensure lifetime learning? Yeah. So is that like the toughest question? I think so. So um, <laughs> let me pull the crystal ball out and predict uh, 2050. All right. Um, so first of all, it's healthcare. So all right. Um, <laughs> So it's interesting. I was reading, we were talking about um, Disrupt the Ready. You know, there is an article that I think came out in Inc. Magazine, I think it was back in like 2017, that was talking about all of these that careers that will no longer exist mm -hmm. in about 10 to 15, 20 years. And you think about just the past 10 years, and I'm thinking about, you know, when. I mean, I'm having flashbacks as I'm walking through the campus, and I'm watching all the students walk around looking at their iPhones and not looking up. And, we didn't do that because they didn't exist when we were <laughs> in school. Um, and we've got these really cool things in healthcare right now that are almost mirroring the Star Trek version of, of healthcare that we had, right? So we've got robots that are assisting surgeons in the middle of surgery, and it's not taking necessarily the place of the surgeons, but you know, the physical manifestation of a surgeon, you can't rotate, well, maybe some of them can it from time to time rotate their entire head 360 degrees. <laughs> it, does, it does sometimes happen, but um, no, but they, they can't rotate like a robot can, so it allows this level of specificity and the ability to take care of patients. This level of technology, so now you've got not just careers, not, not just robots in the OR, but now I need somebody to take care of the robot. Um, and then to, to educate people on the robot. And then they've got new technology. Now it's, it was just in the surgical suites and now it's migrated into the cardiac cath lab suite and it's protecting people from, it's wonderful, protecting the surgeons, the proceduralist against additional radiation so they actually can be physicians for almost 10 years more because most of them had to retire because they were standing up and getting the radiation doses. So this level of technology that we're, that we're seeing coming into healthcare, but in, in every single industry. And so I, while I appreciate the article saying that these certain careers will go away, thinking about what other jobs will then, that we don't even know about today, will exist. Um, and so thinking about how does JMU prepare um, for that future? And um, Jen, you mentioned this, this earlier too. Um, it's that level of agility. And I didn't really appreciate JMU's liberal arts until um, later on in understanding that while technical, law, uh, technical skills are, are fantastic, it's the level of creativity, the, cr the critical thinking, the level of engagement, the teamwork, the relationship building. Um, I don't think Alexa is going to be put in charge of change management for a 25,000 employee base, right? Maybe, go Alexa. Um, but, but thinking about that, that takes individuals who have gone through the training and education like you do at JMU who have been in these amazing you know, case studies environments learning from amazing other leaders and alumni. Um, that's, I think, the skill set for the future. It may be, so, you know, where the generation before us, it was maybe the one job with the pension and you're in the same job for 50 years. You know, we're, we're not 50 years, but probably one, one two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. But now the um, students coming out, it's 10 to 15 jobs that mm -hmm. you might have. And that's completely okay. This career ladder of the past is not necessarily the career ladder, it's a jungle gym. Right? You can go from 
where you start to that next job, that then that next job over here might take you up to where you wanted to be. So it's the agility, the critical thinking, the creativity, the teamwork, the leadership skill set. Um, which comes from the liberal arts. Which comes from the liberal arts, absolutely. I, um, I, I think a, a strong technical base is wonderful, but that, in fact, that career from that technical base may not exist. We were talking about cloud computing, and sorry for anybody who's in that particular <laughs> class. That may absolutely be critical, but who, are we still gonna be talking about that in 10 years? Maybe, maybe not, but we will be talking about leadership. We will be talking about critical thinking. We will be challenging the status quo and change management and entrepreneurship um, and making sure that um, hopefully that we're solving the world's problems in a, in a creative and, and passion-driven driven way. And that starts with liberal arts, I think. Do the two of you wanna to add to that? I would just love to focus on a point Carrie made. I don't think it's either or. I think that we need everyone to have critical thinking skills. I think we need everyone to have some level of digital literacy and a comfort with data. That's the world we're all going to live in. And I don't think we should separate those skills and consider ourselves either a technologist or not, or a leader or not, or a, a thinker or not, right? Mm -hmm. Can't we all be literate in digital technology, good thinkers, and good leaders, and we should aspire to that and let people know they can aspire to that too. They don't have to pigeonhole themselves, especially students, way too early to do that. Look at all of us. We all ended up on different paths than we would have told you we were on when we were 18 or even 22. So let's keep our options open. Jen, or should I go to the audience? No, I think that was perfectly said. Mr. President, I would love to turn it over to the audience for questions and discussion, but I can't see anybody to have them raise their hand. Yeah, so raise your hands if you have a question. You can see Mike? Yep. Good. <laughs> I just want to say thank you all for being here. This is greatly appreciated by everyone here. My name is Ryan Mata. I'm a sophomore engineering major. And a question I just had for you all is when you try and implement a new form of management or some new system throughout your company, what are some methods that you find best work to help that system develop? Did you hear that? I think I didn't. Could you just say it one yeah. more time in your loudest voice? <laughs> <laughs> when you all try to implement a new management method or a new system throughout your company, what methods do you find best help that system grow and foster throughout your company? We call Jen because yeah. <laughs> SAP is fantastic at this, and we. No, I'm kidding. Best customers. We are one of her best customers, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> at least that's what she's staying on stage, and I'll take yeah. it. No, you make an, a really an important point. When we are implementing a new system in the company, it's far less about the technology itself and far more about the change management, helping to get the workforce trained on the system re-engineering our processes because it's often better to change our processes than try to change a system that's been built purposely. And so these are all wraparound capabilities that we think about every time we implement new technology, both within our company and that's what we do for our customers as well. And I'm only half joking because we do use SAP and Jen's company is fantastic at helping us implement their technology in a way that's most productive for our company. Thank you for that reference, You're Kathy. welcome. Um, I, have to, I have to add on since I am you know, part of a technology company. You know, it's, it's interesting looking at companies today. What, what I hear from CEOs today, and you have to back me up on this, is, you know, it's not so much about just modernization, right? Modernization is about automating what you already do. Mm -hmm. To Kathy's point, it's about transforming and doing things in new ways. I mean, if you, if you talk to any CEO out there in business today, right, they are, they are thinking, of, they're moving into new markets. Take a company like Mars. Okay, we all know Mars is a candy company. Guess what? They're in the pet business now, right? 
companies are evolving, they're moving into different industries, they're moving into new, bi new business models. So it's more and more about um, technology is no longer something that is a hindrance to be able to think completely differently. It can support ideas that technology could never have been able to support five and 10 years ago. And so that thinking really, really opens up. And I'd say the second thing that's really critical, and, and, you, and you hear it in Kathy's answer is, you know, true transformation isn't just driven by the IT department. It used to be that the IT department, you know, kind of followed the strategy of the C-suite, the CEO and, and the executive team. Now, you know, every company in a sense is becoming a digital company one way or another. And so the CEO is taking ownership of that and driving that transformation. And when you think about the success of true transformation, it has to be driven by the business leadership so that people understand the why. You have to start with the why. Yes to quote Simon Sinek, and that's a great book if you guys haven't read that. But that's, that's how I, typically what we see. You know, I think the only thing I would um, add to that is when you're talking about change is that, and I love the comment about understanding the why, is also including the individuals to whom the change will impact into the process and giving input along the way so that there is ownership built in. And while um, we've got amazing ideas and amazing, amazing boards, amazing shareholders, which I don't have, but um, I have community, because um, we're a community asset, um, the people who understand the work the best are the people that are in the work every single day. So um, I, I um, am a big believer, uh, I'm taking the performance improvement, the the actions and the change to the people that are in the work every single day and let them lead it and have and respect them enough to recognize the great ideas that they bring to the, ta the table. Um, so I would also just, sometimes people think that it's people at the top who make all of the decisions and they can definitely set the strategy, but the people who get it done every day are the ones that have the truly the best ideas. So how do you harness those ideas in an effective way to truly ensure that the change is accepted, adopted, and, and, and moved forward? And most likely in a much better, with a much better outcome than we would ever have imagined. So, great question. Thank you. Mike, other questions? Right Hello. Uh, I'm Ryan Croft. I'm actually a 2006 JMU graduate of international business, and I'm a tech startup founder up in Washington, D.C. I was so inspired by this panel, I decided to come down just for the day to hear it. Um, my question is, um, as an entrepreneur or anyone in business, you always have an element of self-doubt and wondering as you're growing up the ranks, kind of, am I doing the right thing? How do you guys sort of push that aside as you made your career path to continue forward and, and know that you're ready for the next role as you r rose? the ranks in your careers. Thanks. So Ryan, it's a great question. And I think that you never completely quell the inner self that asks the question, am I ready for this? Is this something that I'm capable of? Should I keep persevering when things look challenging and, and like perhaps you should take a different direction? But you have to draw upon the confidence that comes with experience. And I really encourage some early career uh, exposure of getting out of your comfort zone. Because as you get further in your career, it's those times that I still draw back on that I got out of my comfort zone, I figured things out that I didn't know how they would turn out. And I realized that once I've done that a few times, I've got the capacity and the capability to keep doing it. And that's what has helped me to deal with that inner self questioning that will continue to happen, I think, you know, throughout your life and your career. You just get more resilient in coping with it the more times you put yourself into challenging situations and come out on the other side. And coming out on the other side, by the way, doesn't mean you always do something successfully. Yeah. by other people's definition or maybe even by your own. It might be that you came out the other side, you learned a valuable lesson, it was painful, and yet you realized you're still alive, you're yeah. still uh, <laughs> able to contribute, and you've dusted yourself off and moved forward to the next uh, opportunity. That's awesome. I think, I think most great leaders have made some awesome mistakes. <laughs> And you know, and, and I, I always use to. I'm gonna I'm gonna use an analogy to describe what you just talked about, which is, anybody out there do yoga? Yes. Okay. 
So think of not a lot, not enough of you. No. So if you if you <laughs> if you think about yoga, right? You're on this mat. You're contorted into these really uncomfortable positions. <laughs> you can't get out. <laughs> that, that you can't get out of and you, you stop breathing and all you want is to get out of it. And yeah. the reality is you have a teacher there who's saying, breathe, breathe lean into it. And then when you get out of the pose, you realize just like you said, wow, I'm stronger, I'm more flexible. I'm gonna remember this pose the next time I get into it and it's gonna be easier next time. And a lot of times when we have hardships in life or when we make mistakes, our natural inclination, especially when I was younger, was to resist it. You know, resist it and get out of it and just get away from it. And I find myself, you know, as I, as I kind of grew from that, um, you have to embrace your mistakes. And that doesn't mean you dwell on them. It means you take, what am I, you, you can always take something from a horrible experience. It might just be a something really little, but I always believe in life, what's the thing you're going to take from that horrible experience and carry that with you and make it, make it help you to be better and let everything else go. And you'll find that you will become, I've, I always, I actually feel now, I don't know about you all, I feel now sometimes most comfortable when I'm uncomfortable. Because yes. I think that's when it's fun, that's when you think differently, and that's when the ideas come. I love this. I learned I've been doing professional yoga all these years and I didn't even exactly. know it. <laughs> professional yoga, yes. Yeah, I would just say greatness never came from comfort. I mean, in any example you could ever imagine, it was not from a position of comfort. So, and I was talking to, I had a wonderful opportunity to talk to quite a few students today, um, and I encouraged them to never take a job that you feel completely comfortable with. Because it, you, that means you're not growing enough. You've got to stretch. And I have you, and I'm so glad you said your, your comment earlier about today about, you know, sometimes women need to, feel like they checked 100% of the boxes before they move into that role and that said the exact same thing this morning like you've got to stretch you've got to get uncomfortable um, and you know every single successful whether it's sports or whether it's Steve Jobs or anybody else they had massive failures but they also had massive successes so just pick yourself up dust yourself off keep going Hi, I'm all the way in the back. Um, my name is Lexi Leeds, and I'm a junior marketing major. Um, and this question is for all of you. Since you are all three powerful women in business and are very successful in your positions, throughout the concept of the glass ceiling, how do you feel like this has affected you, and how have you overcome this? Okay, I didn't completely catch that. The concept of the glass ceiling, oh. how have you experienced it and overcome mm -hmm. it? Ah. <laughs> so I, I bet the answer for all of us is yes. Um, and I think if we heard it correctly, I think, have you experienced the glass, uh, glass ceiling? Um, so I don't, you know, we stand on, I, I, I stand on the shoulder of giants of the, the women who came before and paved a path that I just took a little bit further. And I hope um, that I've got women generations from now that are standing on my shoulders and I helped in some way, shape, or form. Um, just like every single challenge um, and every single discomfort, um, you push past it. Um, and, and I used this example earlier, you also call it out. Um, and I um, have called out mansplaining uh, oh, yeah. with fellow colleagues. A lot of that going on. Um, but because I don't. They didn't, I don't, they didn't recognize what they were doing at the time. Um, but now they do, and there's greater respect there. And so we have a, you know, it's a much more collegial conversation. I'm not sure I would have felt comfortable doing that in my, um, the earlier part of my career, but I have absolutely no problem doing it now. You know, it's interesting. I, and, and Kathy, I'm curious if, 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 if you uh, experience the same. You know, there weren't as many women leaders around when I was coming up the ranks, but I worked for some really great men. Mm -hmm. And um, I had some, and, you know, I was fortunate in that I, um, I had great male colleagues and I had some great um, male sponsors, not men mentors are people who give you advice, sponsors are people that pull you along and really, really want you to be successful and, and, and push you. Um, and I had some great, uh, great male sponsors and so I think sometimes when we talk about you know whether it be women or underrepresented minorities 
you know, the conversation has to move beyond just women or underrepresented minorities having those conversations with each other. It requires everybody to come together. And so, um, you know, for me, I, I think it's super important to have those kinds of discussions and involve everybody in that. And many times we don't make men part of, you know, those conversations yes. and, and those decisions that need to happen. And again, I feel like I'm a product of great people who happen to be men. I learn from so many people now. I find as a leader, I many times learn more from the people who work for me and come from completely different backgrounds and have a whole less amount of experience in years, but so many different experiences that I can learn from. And I would add just one thing if I could. I know it's my role, but I'll do it anyway. No, please. And that's that um, sometimes the men are much better mentors or role models or helpers than the other women are. I mean, there are times when the glass ceiling is imposed on you by some women who believe they are where they are and they don't, they're not particularly anxious to have any other younger women join them. So I've, I've experienced that once or twice, not often, but I have once or twice. So again, I'm very careful not to define who helps me by gender. Mm -hmm. Yes. I agree with that completely, Bobby. And I think the important thing for all of us to remember is that progress is made when people who have achieved success don't focus on their own yes. success, but who helped them get there, and then you become that person that yes. helps the next person. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, yes. that is your responsibility when you have achieved something to recognize you didn't do that alone, none of us do, and the people who helped you along the way, you wanna be more like them. Yes than the people who focus on themselves. So yes. I would just highly encourage all of us to think about that. And success happens at lots of levels. So it's also not when you reach the top level of your chosen career path. That rule applies all yes. along the way. Yes, absolutely. Can I have one last question from the audience and then I'm gonna pose a final question for me in order to keep to the time, Jonathan, is that all right? We have plenty of time? Oh, good. Never mind. <laughs> uh, question. Hi. My name is Liam Downey. I'm a physics and math double major. And going back to the disrupt ready concept that you mentioned, I don't quite know whether or not I want to gain an opportunity with something that I'm currently studying and is related to that, or if I seek something out that I don't even have any background on. And I don't know if that will help me out because my father once told me that most people who end up in their career don't even do something that was related to what they studied in college. So I don't quite know where I should go or if there's something that I should look for. Thank you. I didn't hear any of that. Yeah, did you? Uh, I'm gonna try to paraphrase and you tell me if I got it right because they didn't hear. So you're a physics and math major and you're not sure what you wanna do with those fields of study quite yet, but you're wondering if that is uh, problematic or if that's something that you figure out along the way. Oh, perfect. Uh, so, <laughs> so first of all, since you're a physics and math double major, we'll hire you. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say, I think you're fine. <laughs> but, but, but let's talk afterward, seriously. Uh, <laughs> Look, and I say that because physics and math are two fields of study that test your, your brain capacity and teach you how to think. And those are such critical skills. We were both talking uh, about that, uh, Jen and I, and Carrie, I know you said that downstairs yeah. as well. And what we all want are people who are great thinkers. But history majors are also great thinkers. Some of our best talent are people who have reflected on the past and are bringing that forward to the future. So you don't have to be studying something that has already destined you toward a career path, like computer programming or nursing. Those are great fields too. But I think some of the general studies uh, are also fantastic things to focus on. And employers will help you when you get into your area of interest to move around and apply your degree in different ways. In our company, some of our best engineers are physics majors. It's just the way it works. And we hire thousands of engineers 
and less physics majors, but when I look at the top talent, many of them were our physics majors. And so it's interesting how that happens, that the skills you develop around thinking can actually make you better at a number of different chosen professions. And that's why I think it's important not to focus on what was your major, but what did you take away from it? And what are the underlying skills, knowledge, and abilities that you walked away with? And then employers will help you figure out how to best use those. Not many people can say that they've been recruited personally by I the know. chairman and CEO of Northrop Grumman. So, like, put that on your resume. Without even, without even having a security clearance. Right. Yeah. We'll work on that. <laughs> I, I think, too, you know, back to the story that I started with, which is there's so many forks in the road. Yeah. You, you know, like, the decision that you make of where you're going to go work right out of college is, is going to be one step in a much longer journey. So you have to think about who do you, you know, what do you want to learn? Who do you want to keep company with? The people and the culture of a company, the purpose of that company, um, and what you're going to be doing, that really matters, right? And what you learn those first few years and those experiences really, really do. I mean, I met my husband in my first job, right? I met some of my best friends in the first job. So again, just don't play it forward so much and see where it takes you. And like Kathy said, you're going to be fine. The other thing I would um, I'd maybe add to that, and I talked to a few of the students earlier today, is um, I think sometimes we get so focused on what the job title is, um, or I want to work for this particular company. Um, I would just encourage the students in the room to really think about, and this sounds a, maybe a little hokey, but think about what brings you joy. We are only here on this earth once, and it is a very short period of time. And, and when you think about it. Life is too short to not do what you love. So spend some time and think about what brings you joy. What, it, what, do, you, what do you get excited and passionate about? Um, and focus, your career will follow that. It, it will, but if you, um, if you go into a job and you end up hating it, how horrible. And then think about, you know, five, 10, 15 years out and you're doing something that it does not bring you joy. I just, what a, what a disservice to the possibility that you could have, what you could have done over those 15 years that could have been, could have been wasted. So just please, I just implore you, implore you to find what brings you joy. Um, and if it's in healthcare, see me later. <laughs> More questions? Hi. Um, my name is Rachel Dishman, and I'm a freshman business management major. And my question is, as successful business women, um, what's the hardest obstacle that you've had to overcome, and what is your advice to future business women entering the field? That's a really good question. Jen, you try first. I think that the hardest thing for me is, uh, you know, when I think back was, you talked about it a little bit earlier, but I'm going to put a title on what you talked about. It's the imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. right? Um, so the imposter syndrome is kind of that feeling that somebody's going to figure out you're really not qualified for that job. Like you're waiting for the tap on the shoulder to say, I'm really sorry, we made a really big mistake. Yeah. You're not quite ready yet. <laughs> and, um, and, and it's, I think, natural. I think that in a way that can really drive you and, um, and can push you. And at the same time, um, you know, people who care tend to take things personally. And one of the things I realized, this was, this was very early on in my career, well, not too early on, is you know, if I would have maybe a, a tough discussion with somebody who happened to be a man, and maybe we were disagreeing about something, and the conversation would end and it was uncomfortable, I would be replaying it over and over in my mind about what I should have said, what I could have said. I was like plotting my revenge for the next time I saw him about <laughs> what I was going to say. And then I realized that, you know, he walked away and wasn't thinking about it anymore. And that's a good thing. And, and what I learned from that is, um, you know, I need to just stop taking things personally. And sometimes, like, it's okay to have these discussions and, and, and have differences of opinion. And not everybody is, is holding that against you or judging you or thinking about every word you said. We're, we're our toughest critics. And I think sometimes you just got to give yourself a little slack. And I, so I'm going to build off of that um, as well. And um, I'd also talk about micro-resilience. 
So um, when you're having those really tough situations that you, we have a ten, and I do this too, it's like keeps you up at night or I pop up at one o'clock in the morning, can't get back to sleep because I'm processing this thing um, that may have happened or I wish I had done this differently or they've got this thing coming up is that um, it's, um, healthcare can be real, and I'll just speak because that's what I live and breathe. Healthcare can be very challenging. Some of the decisions that we make are, are I would say the majority of the decisions that we make have some type of connection to life and death. So that's very powerful, right? So there are moments where um, taking a moment to just breathe and finding resilience in your work and the burnout rate um, for physicians and clinicians is enormous. I mean, that the highest successful suicide rate professionally is with physicians. Uh, medical school class dies every single year out, um, out for suicide. And we're already at a deficit of physicians. How horrible is that? So find moments of how do you pause, reflect on the good things, and find those micro resilience. And we were talking about books earlier, Simon Sinek, I love, by the way. Um, but also Bonnie St. John is a great, she's a great um, uh, social media feed of just reminding yourself from those little moments in the day that remind you about how great things are and how you can find get back to your purpose and for me it's going and talking to our patients and it's the, hearing the story of the four-year-old who um, stopped breathing at the Great Wolf Lodge when she was um, on vacation with her family and she was with the entire family and she stopped breathing and we were able to bring her back to life and now she's a fully functioning you know five-year-old and they've come back to celebrate and have birthdays that's pretty cool stuff I saw hands over there. Could somebody bring a microphone to the left? And then we'll go to the right. Uh, Brian Riley, senior economics major. Uh, my question is, why do we work so much? You mentioned <laughs> earlier that uh, because of AI and automation that the composition of work is definitely gonna change. But do you think that that can change the amount of work also like going down the next 20, 30 years? You know, I, the trend is going in the other direction. Technology means we're connected all the time, and the world is more connected. So every company becomes a global company and has access to customers around the globe, and that means companies never sleep. Hopefully the, the employees do <laughs> with good management, but it really is creating an environment where employees need to create some boundaries and some discipline because the work will always be there. Mm -hmm. you, you could work literally in most of our companies 24 hours a day and you'd be connected in a way at home on, on a date uh, that work can interrupt. And so you do have to set boundaries for yourself. And I find within our workforce, it's not the leadership asking people to work crazy hours oftentimes, it's that people feel because they're connected, they have to respond right away, or that they want to be viewed as responsive. And we have to tell people, that's not the expectation. We want you to take time for yourself, and we want you to set boundaries. I think it's really important that we all learn how to do that effectively. Yeah, I would, I would just add to it. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier that we have a uh, we've been acknowledged by the great place to work. Um, and part of that is understanding understanding boundaries and being very specific about it. Just like my out of office currently says, please do not email me so you can, so you can help me manage my inbox. Um, and so I've also told my team, you know, I'm out, of, I'm out of pocket, you know, call me if you emergently need me. So we have to personally set our own boundaries, but because I'm in my leadership role, it then allows my team to also set boundaries for themselves and you set that example for the, for the rest of the, the organization. I will also say, though, for in healthcare, it's a little interesting. So the physicians of the past and um, used to work, you know, you know, 70 plus hours. So the physician today that's retiring, who's part of the baby boomer generation, is now typically replaced by two and a half physicians. So they're rec and there's more women coming also into um, into medicine, which is which is wonderful. And so they also want to have um, I don't like the term work life balance, um, but a family and work at the same time, which is amazing. 
Uh, so, but how do we as organizations be very thoughtful and encourage um, uh, that type of, um, that work life? Because I do truly believe that people are better at work and better at taking care of um, other patients if they are taking care of themselves. And how can we as an organization help them take care of themselves, not just for the patients, but for the caregivers? We spend a lot of time on that at, at Wellstar. That's why our tagline is people care. So um, we, that's, that's who we are, that's what we do. I think you'll see leaders focusing a lot more on this, and it does start with leadership setting the example and the tone. And just like athletes who you know, m might be in the Olympics, they train, they sleep, they eat well, they exercise. Your body and your brain need the same thing. We don't pay people for their stamina, we pay them for, you know, for their mind and their ideas. And, and I do really believe that you're gonna start to see leaders and probably even new businesses forming around disconnecting. Uh, I just want, before that question, I wanna just insert one thing. This is a very family-oriented panel. Yes. Kathy, how many kids? Two, two boys. Carrie? Two. Boy, girl. Two boys. Five, three, three girls, two boys, and 12 grandchildren. So we all know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm much older than they are. Enough to combine all of us together. Yes, combine all yeah. of us. We have more than two football teams. OK. <laughs> this question. Hi. Uh, I'm Colette. I'm a communications and sociology major. Um, so I have a lot of curiosity about ethics. Uh, so I kind of was just curious on if you all could give a specific example of a time your personal ethics and morals were compromised and how you worked through this issue. Oh, I love that cool. question. Oh, wow. We're going deep. So I love this question, and thank you so much for asking it. So, um, so I'm, a, I'm a, um, a big believer of um, having ethics as part of a muscle that you constantly work, especially in healthcare. Um, and actually in everything, but it, in healthcare. So with my team, um, we, we have an ethics moment at the beginning of almost every single meeting. And we talk about very challenging situations and, and talk through um, with each other. And it's not just ethics related to, you know, a person's on life support, do you pull, you know, I'm not, absolutely clinical ethics, but I'm talking about business ethics, about um, how are we going to handle this situation? How do we maintain our commitment to our mission, vision, and values in our culture um, um, and while we make this very, very challenging and difficult uh, decision? So ethics is part of what we do and what I believe in, and, and I'm, I'm a firm believer that um, there's the definition of you know ethical erosion is that most really horrible situations didn't start out being a horrible you know I, um, there's health south in, in the healthcare field and there's probably case studies about that but it started as a a rounding up of about I think five thousand dollars and then it ended up being millions of dollars and, but it was the decision at that first moment um, that somebody said oh it's only five thousand. Um, that's ethical erosion and that's where it all starts. Um, but I also, I, I belong to a, a national organization and I'm board certified in healthcare management and part of that board certification requires a commitment to the code of ethics um, for, for healthcare um, leadership. So um, I, I, I don't, there's no air between, there's no light between strong leadership and um, ethics. Leaders have to set a clear uh, and distinct boundary around what is ethical behavior and what isn't. And then you have to manage all the way to what I call micro decisions and hold people accountable when they do stray into what they might consider gray space, but isn't gray space. It is a step in a direction that can harm a company's culture, a company's reputation, and do irreparable damage. And so it really is critical that ethics be at the cornerstone of a company's value system, that it's communicated clearly, and that actions are taken if we see any moves to erode that ethical foundation. Yeah, agreed. And I think it starts with creating, you know, uh, for people who see things, you know, it's kind of like if you see something, say something, and you really have to create a culture of psychological safety, right, where people will speak up and people will do the right thing. And 
What's interesting too is a lot of times, like that example you just gave, it's helping people understand little things matter. Little decisions matter. And, and so we talk a lot, like ethics and compliance isn't just a department that sits over here and you, you don't just refer. Th I mean, leaders today, you know, in all of our business, like you said, you start the, the meetings with, with this topic. And, and I'm sure, Kathy, you and I, when we're, when we're meeting with our teams, we always talk about not just doing business, but doing good business doing the right kind of business and giving examples of what that means. And in a global, when you're in a global company, you know, we make assumptions that everybody operates in the same moral character as, as we do or this country does as an example. And it's, it's very difficult to, to make sure that you are, you have to over communicate this and give people examples of where that line is. Because many people think of it as this, you know, really, it has to be something really egregious that some, some, somebody does or something happens or not. And it's those little things that many times it's about an education and talking about it. Hi, um, I'm Abby Maltese. I'm a sophomore here. I'm an engineering major and also on the soccer team. Um, with that comes a lot. And you've talked about pushing through uncertainty and uncomfortable situations. So I was just wondering with um, jobs at such a high level, how you guys all prioritize your workload and other responsibilities. So relying on a great team is the foundation for any leader. You have to surround yourself with a talented team and then you have to involve them in the work and let them do their jobs. And that requires trust and confidence. It also requires uh, a sense that this is a team effort and it's not about one individual. I think the other thing that is really important in the way that a leader is resilient is being able to understand what's the most material thing. Because there will be a lot of demands on one's day. And prioritization is thinking through what is it that only I can do? Mm -hmm. What is it that is important for me to do? And what is it that if I do it well is really going to make a difference? And so those are the kinds of questions I ask myself in trying to decide where do I spend my time and where do I use the team to help get other work done. I think that also translates into, and I don't know if you were going there with this question, but we, we just highlighted that we have um, a few kids. So um, we also have a, a personal life too, and we have um, um, kids that depend on us um, to be very good parents at the same time as leading, you know, in my case, which is much smaller than yours, but 25,000 team members. <laughs> um, so I used this example um, earlier with uh, some, of the, some of the students. I don't like that term work-life balance. I, I just don't like it. And um, coming as a dance major, for those who know how to dance, which I'm sure is everybody because you're at JMU, you can, you can all bust a move. Um, but uh, it's, it's finding, your, finding your center. And the only way you find you can truly balance is finding your center. That means your head is aligned with your heart and it's aligned with your gut. Anytime that that's off kilter, that you're making decisions that your heart doesn't agree with, um, or making decisions that it just doesn't feel right in your gut, then I would challenge you to say, I need to, I need to take a step back and find my center again. Um, and that may mean that um, I need to be at my, my son's um, school once a month. That may mean I've got to, maybe I miss one of the um, soccer games this weekend, but I'm going to go to the other one. You know, so I'm not going to be 100% in both. I'm not holding myself accountable to that. Um, but nobody can decide or determine your balance um, than you. You have, to say, you have to determine what's the most important um, in your life and, and give yourself some grace. Um, just give yourself some grace. You're not going to be perfect all the time. I'm not going to be a perfect parent. I'm not going to be a perfect leader. And I love this term, which is, or this phrase, you don't have to walk on water. All you have to do is swim across. <laughs> and I remind myself of that um, quite frequently in both being um, a, a healthcare leader in a very complex situation, but also a parent of two very dynamic children. <laughs> I think 
Kathy described it, you know, it's, it's as in these jobs, you have to have focus. And because if you don't have focus, then you can't give everybody else focus. I had somebody who worked for me, this was years ago. They said, the best thing you can give us, Jen, is focus. And that always spoke to me because it realized if I didn't kind of have my act together in terms of what was important, how could I expect others to be their most productive and best version of themselves? And focus allows you to, like, like Kathy described, like what's important and what matters based on the priorities that I have set for myself. And you have to be a really good communicator. You know, when you are focused on something, you have to be able to communicate very directly with people, efficiently, clearly, so that you can, other people can help you get things done. And you have to know when to say no to certain things. It's like you want to you wanna touch everything, and you have to realize there's probably a lot of better people. I mean, Kathy will probably agree when I say there's lots of really amazing people who probably do things a lot better than we do and who are better than a lot of things than we are. And you want to give them the ability to do that and help as well. More questions? Hi, um, I'm Daphne. I'm a sophomore international business major. And my question is, what's your favorite quote or saying that you either try to live by or that you feel has helped you on your journey to where you are? Uh, so I've already given a couple quotes. Um, but um, the one that I go back to probably every single day is that history arcs towards justice. Um, and it's Martin Luther King. Um, and I have to remind myself <laughs> frequently. Um, but the, um, there are decisions that are made from, from time to time that may not be in the best interest of the patients and the communities that we're serving that are beyond my control. And um, you owe it, and that patient advocacy, advocacy just sticks with me. But I would, I would I'd go back to that one to just bring me solace. And then the other one, just as being a parent, is the, the comment that I just made, which is uh, you don't have to walk on water, all you have to do is swim across. So those are my, probably my top two. So for me, two come to mind. One is the, the Maya Angelou quote, you know, people don't always remember what you say, but they'll remember how you made them feel. I think that's so true in business and personal. And then the other one that somebody said to me one time is, Jen, nothing's ever as good as it seems, and it's never as bad as it seems. And I love that because when things are going well in your life, you always have to remember to stay grounded and have a sense of humility and to know uh, and to not let complacency set in. And when things are going bad, what you're going to learn after you make enough mistakes is the sun still comes up, everything's going to be OK, you'll get through it. One of my favorite is people don't fear change. They fear the uncertainty that comes with change. And as a leader, I need to remind myself of that a lot because it requires clear communication about the why behind change and providing people that certainty of what it's going to look like when we get to the other side. I'll also say that's important in raising two boys as well. <laughs> you all have given just amazing advice and an extraordinary amount of your time tonight. Could you each? give us one last comment, one last piece of ultimately important advice for students, for faculty, and for the university itself. Have That's fun. not a lot, it's not a lot <laughs> lightning round. But. All right, it's, for me it's have fun, and just, you know, remember what's important. Yeah. Mine's an extension of that, it's just find your joy, bring joy. And I would say your purpose should be your passion and your passion should be your purpose. Yes. Women, thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you all so much. What an amazing group of leaders and what a rare opportunity for all of us. You know, when we scheduled this, I thought, is there some time in the next five years that we can get all of their schedules to coincide and we were so fortunate that you have all taken the time uh, to share your wisdom, your experiences with us. Thank you so much. Can we have another round of applause for our amazing panel? Uh, let's see. Right. We do have uh, a small token of our appreciation for each of our presenters. So uh, Mike is going to share those. And while we're doing that, uh, just a, a quick plug for our final Madison Vision Series event of the semester. It will be on Tuesday, April 7th. 
Farah Pandith, who is the former U.S. Special Representative to Muslim Nations and a best-selling author about how you defeat terrorism uh, and on entrepreneurship and democracy, a, a tremendous uh, best-selling author and, and world-renowned speaker is going to be here on April 7th, so you won't want to miss that. Again, that will be at 6 o'clock p.m. right here in Wilson Hall Auditorium and, of course, is free and open to the public. So thank you all so much for being here. Have a great evening, everybody, and go Dukes! God's children got rhythm.